Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We're very glad to have you with us tonight. And tonight we are continuing in our fairly new study of the book of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we hope to be covering Leviticus 18 through 20 tonight. So we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Leviticus chapter 18. As always, if you have any questions, any concerns, or comments about tonight's class, if you have something that we need to be praying about as a church, let us know. You can get in touch by giving me a call or sending a text to 608-224-0274, or you can also send a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. But as I said, we are continuing in our study of Leviticus tonight. A major theme of this book is holiness, that is, being separate or different from the world. And we've learned that Leviticus is basically a handbook or a manual for the priests, the Levites, those who were responsible for helping people make maintain this holiness before the Lord. So far in the book, we've had a summary of the major types of sacrifices. We've seen the priest ordained. We've seen the first catastrophe in the priesthood as Nadab and Abihu offer unauthorized fire before the Lord, and they are killed right there on the spot for doing so. We've had a summary of what is clean and unclean. We've looked at some really revolutionary guidelines for preventing outbreaks of disease in a large group of people like this. And last week, we looked at the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest would make a sacrifice for the people, and he would also put the sins of the people on the scapegoat, and he would send that goat off into the wilderness. Well, tonight we come to a series of commands that were intended to make a very clear distinction between God's people and the locals up in the promised land where they are heading. And as our practice has been in the study of Leviticus, we are moving rather quickly. I made that promise when we started. I think I've been able to fulfill that promise so far. So we are not looking at every single verse in this book. We are not doing a word-by-word, verse-by-verse study, but we are hitting the highlights. So we're looking at a paragraph here and there, and we're kind of summarizing the rest of it. So I want us to start tonight by looking at the first five verses of Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus 18, and let's start tonight by looking at verses 1 through 5. Leviticus 18, 1 through 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. I am the Lord. As we come to this rather long series of rules and regulations in chapters 18, 19, and 20, notice God starts really by giving the reason for all of this. And let's note, sometimes God doesn't give a reason for his command. Sometimes it's more of a because I said so reason. But here God explains the rationale behind what he's about to command. And if I've understood this correctly, the reason for what comes next is to make a clear distinction between the behavior of the locals and the behavior of God's people. I think most of us understand that as human beings, we tend to mimic or copy what we see happening around us. We have a tendency to want to fit in or to blend in with the world. We often want to be like the people around us. And so if our neighbors mow their grass, for example, we have a tendency to mow our grass and so on. Well, what applies to everyday normal behavior also applies to immoral behavior. However, God wants his people to be different, to be holy, separate, or set apart. And this holiness is based on God's character. That's what we find in this opening paragraph. This holiness is based on who God is. And so in verse 2, God wants Moses to address the people and to explain this. I am the Lord your God. And all of what comes next is then justified by who God is. God has every right to tell his people what to do. And then we notice in verse number three that God does not want his people doing what they saw being done back in Egypt, where they've been living for the past 400 years. I think we also understand culture has a way of rubbing off on us, and these people have definitely been affected by the culture. So they are to make a clean break. They are to make a fresh start going forward. However, also notice that God gives the warning that just as they are not to do what they saw being done in Egypt, 
so also they are not to do what they see being done in the land of Canaan where they are heading. You shall not walk in their statutes, God says. So God's people are to be separate. They are to be distinct. They are to be unique. You are not to walk in their statutes. Don't follow their laws. Follow my laws, my statutes, God says. And again, because I am the Lord your God, he says. And the benefit to obedience down in verse 5 is that they may live. So you can obey God and live. And the implied consequence is if they do not obey, they will die either as a natural result of disobedience, getting sick from eating an animal that dies on its own for some reason, or as a result of God's judgment, that is, receiving the death penalty for some immoral behavior. And we'll get to the death penalty for some of these things in chapter 20. So let's jump right into it tonight by noting the first verse of the next section. In Leviticus 18, verse 6, notice God says, None of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. And then we've got a long list of examples of how someone might do this. And I think this may be a good time to note a difference in some of the translations. I'm using the New American Standard Bible, the 1995 update for this series of lessons. That's what we normally preach from. That's what we have in our pews. And they are probably the most literal here in terms of a word-for-word -word translation, and this would be similar to what's in the English Standard Version and some of the others. However, I was doing some of my initial study for tonight's lesson in the NIV, the New International Version. And the NIV is known for being a little bit more of a thought-for-thought -thought translation as opposed to being strictly word-for-word. -word. And I, I am terribly oversimplifying this, but I want us to notice the NIV says in this verse that no one is to approach any close relative <clears throat> to have sexual relations. So notice the difference between uncovering nakedness as opposed to sexual relations. And I think we understand now, uh, apparently to uncover someone's nakedness was a figure of speech in those days. It was a uh, euphemism for sexual relations. And so the question is, how do we translate this? And so we've got the actual words in Hebrew, the New American Standard, many others, they've chosen to translate those words word for word as best they can from Hebrew into English. But the NIV and many other modern translations have decided to take this figure of speech and they've chosen to translate not word for word, but they've taken the words and translated the meaning or the thought behind those words. And in this case, it's not that one is right and the other is wrong, uh, but we just need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of these two approaches. And I think that's why it's important to consult a translation like the NIV, uh, especially in a study like this, but really especially in a study like the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs especially is just full of figures of speech uh, that we might completely miss with a study of a translation that is purely word for word. So it's good to compare and certainly good to be aware of this. And I'm just saying we, we have one really good example of this right here in Leviticus chapter 18. So although the rest of this chapter talks about uncovering someone's nakedness, that is actually a euphemism, a figure of speech referring to having sexual relations. And in the rest of this paragraph, God forbids his people from having sexual relations with any close relative. And he'll go on and he'll, he will give the gruesome details here. This includes your mother. This includes your father's wife, your sister, your aunt, your daughter-in-law, your sister-in-law. You can't have relations with both a woman and her daughter, whoever they are. That's just wrong. And then he throws in not having sexual relations with a woman during her period, as well as having relations with your neighbor's wife. Uh, he bans sacrificing any of your children to Molech. It's kind of a, doesn't fit in with these other prohibitions here, but Molech was a local pagan god. Um, and then he goes on to explain a man is not to lie with a man as a man lies with a woman. So homosexual relations, that's detestable, God says in this passage. And then God also prohibits his people from having sexual relations with animals. This is a perversion, he says. And this is basically a summary of Leviticus 18, verses 6 through 23, which we haven't really taken the time to read. I've just kind of given the summary of it here. Feel free to read that on your own. Uh, and we'll come back to some of the penalties for this behavior in chapter 20. That's where we'll end tonight. However, before we wrap up Leviticus 18, let's kind of skip ahead to the last paragraph 
And this is where God once again uh, gives a reason for these commands that he's just given. And notice the reason comes in verses 24 through 30. This is Leviticus 18, verses 24 through 30. Do not defile yourselves by any of these things. For by all these things, the nations which I am casting out before you have become defiled. For the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought its punishment upon it so that the land has spewed out its inhabitants. But as for you, you are to keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not do any of these abominations, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. For the men of the land who have been before you have done all these abominations, and the land has become defiled, so that the land will not spew you out should you defile it, as it has spewed out the nation which has been before you. For whoever does any of these abominations, those persons who do so shall be cut off from among their people. Thus you are to keep my charge that you do not practice any of the abominable customs which have been practiced before you, so as not to defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. So once again, we come back to the reason behind the commands given in this chapter. God explains uh, these sins have defiled the people of the land and that his people are to be different. They are to be different in their behavior. The locals did all these things. And basically, the land vomited them out because of it. They were spewed out. And so they are getting removed from the land for doing these things. So God is saying, therefore, do not do the same things they did, or else you will be removed from the land as well. So this is God's warning. This is God's promise. If someone does any of these things, notice God says in verse 29, this person is to be cut off from among their people. In other words, they are to be kicked out of the community, removed from the fellowship of God's people. And in that day of time, that would have been a hugely severe punishment. I mean, they relied on each other. They were out there in the middle of nowhere. But this is serious. And so just as serious as removing someone with an infectious disease. That was the, you know, the physical danger of a disease spreading. There is also a similar spiritual danger to sin spreading. So just as uh, there is to be a quarantine for leprosy, uh, so also, in a sense, there is to be a quarantine for sin to keep it from spreading. And I know, although the sins might be different, the punishment and the reasoning behind it might sound a little bit familiar to us. Over in 1 Corinthians 5, ta Paul talks about a man living in sexual sin with his father's wife. And if you remember the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 5, the church was basically proud of this. They were so proud of how loving and how tolerant they were being as a congregation. But Paul says you shouldn't be proud, you should be mourning instead. And Paul goes on to say that such a man is actually to be removed from the congregation, to keep the sin from spreading, to try to save the man's soul, and also to try to maintain the church's reputation in the world. Because even the Gentiles didn't accept that kind of behavior. And that's really how that chapter started. Well, at this is, you know, this is important because God wants his people to be holy. He wants them to actually be separate from the world. And again, this is a ma major theme in the book of Leviticus. Well, let's move through the next chapter rather quickly. We'll start with Leviticus 19. Let's look at verses 1 through 8. Leviticus 19, 1 through 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Every one of you shall reverence his mother and his father, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. Now when you offer a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord, you shall offer it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it and the next day. But what remains until the third day shall be burned with fire. So if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an offense. It will not be accepted. Everyone who eats it will bear his iniquity, for he has profaned the holy thing of the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from his people. Well, as with the previous chapter, I think we have yet another reminder. God is giving these rules so that his people will be holy, set apart, different from the surrounding nations. And some of what we find in this chapter actually seems to be God elaborating on some of the Ten Commandments, starting with this command up in verse 3, that they are to respect their parents. That's in the Ten Commandments. Then we have the Sabbath command. That's in the Ten Commandments. And we have the ban on worshiping idols. That's in the Ten Commandments. And so all of these are repeated from the Ten Commandments, where he just gives maybe a little bit more information. 
Then notice we have the reminder that when a sacrifice is made, they can only eat it the first day or the day after, but they are not to be eating leftovers on the third day. So that right there seems to be something uh, of a food safety issue. So these are some of the consequences. Well, let's just kind of continue quickly with a wide ranging variety of commands in the next section. This is Leviticus 19 verses 9 through 19. Leviticus 19, 9 through 19. Now when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, nor shall you glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. You shall not swear falsely by my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of a hired man are not to remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse a deaf man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall revere your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people, and you are not to act against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. <clears throat> You are to keep my statutes. You shall not breed together two kinds of your cattle. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor wear a garment upon you of two kinds of material mixed together. Well, that is quite the variety. A lot of these seem totally unrelated, but in verses 9 and 10, they are forbidden from reaping to the corners of their fields. And also, they were to only go through the field once. So what was left over after that first pass had to be left, and they were forbidden from harvesting any fruit that fell on the ground on its own. And this was for the poor. This was for the benefit of those who perhaps were not landowners and did not have that ability. As we've noted before, they were not uh, told to harvest and drop off a gift basket for the poor. But the poor actually had a role to play here, and I think there's a lesson here. They might not have been wealthy landowners, but the poor actually had to put some work into this process and they had to go through the fields themselves and they had to do some work in bringing this food home. I've told you before that I've helped glean a field before. I don't know how many of you have been able to glean. Uh, in the mid 80s, as I remember it as a kid, a farmer called my dad at church and apparently says, I've got some extra corn in my field that wasn't harvested. And uh, for some reason, and if you have any poor people in your church, they can come help themselves. <laughs> and uh, I think it was at that moment I learned we were poor. Uh, we drove to that land and we drove to that field, not far from the church building as I remember it, and we picked what was left, like walking through the field picking this random corn. And you know, there is dignity and honor in hard work, isn't there? There is a value to that. We learn something from that. And those who are able absolutely need to be working in some way. And God knows this, and so it's actually in his law. In verse 12, they are not to swear falsely using God's name. In verse 13, they are not to oppress or rob their neighbors. The wages of a hired man are to be paid out at the end of the day. They are not to be held over till the next morning. And God feels quite strongly about this. It may seem like a minor thing to some people, but for the person waiting on that paycheck, it can be a huge deal. And how interesting that God knows this is a concern. In heaven, in his power and glory, he's thinking about a missed paycheck. Um, years and years ago, <clears throat> I remember a time or two when the church treasurer would forget to bring my weekly check. And he'd show up at church and, you know, oh, Baxter, I forgot your check. You know, I'll bring it next week. And there was a time in my life when, when that was completely not okay. And I think some of you have probably been there. If your employer just says, oh, I forgot it this week, I'll get it to you later, um, that can be an issue. And, um, you know, sometimes we literally live from paycheck to paycheck these days. You know, we had little kids at home at the time, maybe. We had bills that are due, mouths to feed. And as some of you know, one missed check can be absolutely devastating financially to a young family. Um, now I'm at a point in my life where I'm not going to starve from one week to the next, so I don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It happens if it happens. You know, but sometimes 
when we're at this better point in our lives, we might forget how tight things really were at some other point earlier on. And so I just find it interesting. God makes a point of making sure that hired laborers get paid on time and they got paid on a daily basis. You did this uh, work in the field and you got paid at, um, at the end of the day. Uh, verse number 14 is amazing. Uh, the middle schooler in me wants to laugh just a tiny bit at this one. I know it's terrible. Um, after all, I mean, the deaf man will never hear you cursing. And so why does God put that in there? Because it's still wrong. It's still wrong, isn't it? And the same goes for tripping a blind man. The blind man's never going to catch you. He's never going to see who did it. You know, so there's no accountability. You can probably get away with something like this. But the point is here, God sees it. And uh, God is concerned about this. And so he puts this little clause in his law, which is amazing. In verse 15, uh, those in a position to render judgments are not to be partial toward the poor, nor are they to defer to the great. And we may be tempted in both directions, depending on the issue before us, where we need to make a decision. You know, sometimes while serving in a position of power, like a judge, or maybe while serving in some other position, like on a jury, or maybe if you're a supervisor at work, you know, we may want to put our finger on the scales kind of to tip the justice in the uh, favor of the poor man. You know, so maybe here's a poor man suing a rich man, and we may be tempted to rule in the favor of the poor man regardless of the facts or the law of that case. Because, you know, the poor man has had a hard life or really deserves a break or for some other reason. Maybe the, the rich man isn't going to miss this money if I rule that he's got to pay the little guy. And God says, no. You know, do justice with no regard for poverty or wealth. Don't let that come into your thinking. And I know sometimes today when someone's being considered for a, you know, like a Supreme Court position or for some other court or public office, you know, people may make a big deal about this person really being able to empathize with certain subgroups. And we may understand the emotion behind that. But in my view, we really need judges who actually follow the law. That, that's like the point of a judge. And that, to me, that seems to be what God is saying to his people there. You know, don't rule for the poor man just because you feel sorry for the poor man. And in the same way, don't be ruling in favor of the rich man just because maybe you think you could get some favor back in the future. Just do what is right and judge according to the facts of the case. In verse 16, no slander. Uh, in verse 17, uh, don't hate your neighbor. You can't even hate him in your heart. So a lot of people think the Old Testament is merely external and the New Testament is merely internal, all feelings. No, God was concerned about the feelings in our hearts even back then. In verse 18, don't take vengeance into your own hands. In fact, love your neighbor. And some people may be surprised that the law of Moses even says this, but it does. In fact, Jesus quotes this as uh, one of the two greatest commandments. Uh, in verse 19, don't be mixing breeds in animals. Don't be mixing seeds uh, or even be making a garment of mixed material. And that one right there, that's a strange one to me. I, I do not understand the why on this one. My only guess is to go back to the context and notice that it's in some way perhaps tied to being different from the pagans around them. Maybe this is what the locals were doing. And God says, don't do it like that. Well, let's continue by going down here now to Leviticus 19, verses 20 through 28. Leviticus 19, 20 through 28. Now, if a man lies carnally with a woman who is a slave acquired for another man, but who has in no way been redeemed nor given her freedom, there shall be punishment. They shall not, however, be put to death because she was not free. He shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord to the doorway of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering. The priest shall also make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for his sin which he has committed, and the sin which he has committed will be forgiven him. When you enter the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you, it shall not be eaten. But in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, an offering of praise to the Lord. In the fifth year, you are to eat of its fruit, that its yield may increase for you. I am the Lord your God. You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not round off the side growth of your heads, nor harm the edges of your beard. 
You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead, nor make any tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Up in verses 20 through 22, God seems to be regulating an abuse that was taking place in the system, where one man would have relations with another man's slave uh, without either redeeming her or purchasing her freedom. And God says, don't do that. It's, it's wrong. You know, she's not free. Th this is a sin that you'll be held accountable for. This is a sin that needs a sacrifice. In verses 23 through 25, they need to let a tree get started for a few years before eating its fruit. In the fourth year, the fruit is the Lord's, presumably given to the Levites, but you can eat the fruit after that. So it's just kind of an interesting horticultural principle. As you get a fruit tree growing, let the energy go to the tree, not the fruit. Kind of focus on uh, the health of the tree overall would be my take on that. Uh, in the last few verses, we're back to don't eat blood, don't mess around with fortune telling, not, nothing like that. Whatever you do, don't trim your beard. Um, I happen to just trim my beard today, you know, every few weeks, whether it needs it or not. And uh, I am not completely sure of the reason for the ban on beard trimming in the Old Testament. Again, I am guessing that it's most likely tied to some kind of pagan practice. Maybe they had some wild beard styles associated with the worship of uh, certain pagan deities. Uh, if you've watched any of the, like the Viking shows, you'll notice it may be beads or certain braids and you know, maybe God is just making sure that they don't do what their neighbors are doing. That's my best guess at this as to the why. Uh, the same goes for the cutting of the body and getting tattoos. Uh, those were banned under the law of Moses. But like beard trimming, uh, these things are no longer against God's law today. Um, I think it was 30 years ago or so, a parent sent their kid to me at church to try to have me talk them out of getting a tattoo. You know, you know, my mom sent me here and she says, you're going to tell me, you know, it's a sin to get a tattoo. Well, we sat down um, and my response was that Jesus has at least two tattoos. And uh, that was not the response I don't think the parents were looking for. So word got around and uh, parents never sent their kids to me ever again for that discussion. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I would just encourage you to read the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 19. It is uh, kind of an eye-opening thing. So anyway, if you want it more, uh, feel free to read Revelation 19 on that. Well, let's continue with Leviticus 19 verses uh, 29 through 37, Leviticus 19, 29 through 37. Do not profane your daughter by making her a harlot, so that the land will not fall to harlotry and the land become full of lewdness. You shall keep my Sabbaths and revere my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Do not turn to mediums or spiritists. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. You shall rise up before the gray-headed and honor the aged, and you shall revere your God, I am the Lord. When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of e Egypt, I am the Lord your God. You shall do no wrong in judgment, in measurement of weight, of or capacity, you shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. <clears throat> you shall thus observe all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am the Lord. <clears throat> I think we'd agree we have another variety pack here, and it ranges from not making your daughter a prostitute to using just weights and balances and everything in between. I'll just note uh, verse 32. Uh, kind of as a general principle, we are to honor the elderly. And I think that's interesting that God includes this here with not making your daughter a prostitute. I mean, it's important. Um, I think we have the Deuteronomy version of this reference in our uh, PowerPoint announcement rotation on Sunday. It might be Leviticus, I'm not sure, but um, with the reminder to save the parking spots directly in front of our building uh, for the elderly, for those with mobility challenges. Sometimes if we don't have those challenges, we don't think about that. But God says, think about it. In verses 33 and 34, they are to take care of the strangers among them. If somebody's passing through, treat them well, because you've been passing through. You know what it's like to not belong uh, from when they lived in Egypt. And then they are to use just weights. Back then, 
Without a bureau of weights and measures, it was especially important for the people to be honest with their weights as they bought and sold various items. So again, just a wide variety of issues here. Um, let's continue into our last chapter for tonight with Leviticus 20, 1 through 5. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also say to the sons of Israel, Any man from the sons of Israel or from the aliens sojourning in Israel who gives any of his offspring to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will also set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given some of his offspring to Molech so as to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. If the people of the land, however, should ever disregard that man when he gives any of his offspring to Molech, so as not to put him to death, then I myself will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut off from among their people both him and all those who play the harlot after him by playing the harlot after Molech. Well, this is a chapter of consequences. We've already seen that much of this is wrong in this chapter, but now we're kind of backtracking and we're learning what the people were to do about it. And here we find that the offender, the person who offers his offspring to Molech, is to be put to death. They are to do it by stoning him with stones. And I think this is the first reference to stoning in the Bible. But this is God's method of execution among his people. This is what he has prescribed. Note, it is a group effort. This is not something one person does. This is a community thing. It's also a method of killing somebody where you don't actually have to touch the body. Remember, it was against God's law to touch the dead um, that would make that person unclean ceremonially. And then also, it's rather graphic, isn't it? It is public. This is memorable. Um, this is very public, very uh, something that you would, uh, you know, like, I don't want to do what that guy did kind of thing. Um, we should also note that they really didn't have prison sentences back in those days. If we skim through this chapter, there's nothing about, you know, five to ten years in prison, nothing like that. And I think one of the main reasons is they were moving through the wilderness. So there really wasn't an effective way of confining somebody for any length of time. Uh, the penalty for these upper level offenses was death. Um, at this point, I don't think we need to read the bulk of the chapter. Pretty much it is a repeat of the offenses that we've read uh, earlier. Uh, but now this is the penalty phase. This is the chapter of penalties. And if we were to keep reading, we would find God also, also authorizes the death penalty by stoning for trying to get in touch with the dead, for dishonoring your parents, for committing adultery, for a man who lies with a man, for anyone who has relations with an animal, and so on. We see this in verses 6 through 16. And then down in verses 17 through 21, we have a list of sins that may be considered kind of somewhat less serious, and they don't require the death penalty, but they do require cutting somebody off from the fellowship of the group. So they are to be banished. At least that's the way I would look at it. They are to be left behind in, in the wilderness. So this is the, uh, the chapter of penalties. <clears throat> so let's kind of skip forward and let's close tonight by looking at the last paragraph in Leviticus 20. And the last chunk that goes together anyway is Leviticus 20. <clears throat> and we'll look at verses 22 through 26. Leviticus 20, 22 through 26. You are therefore to keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them, so that the land to which I am bringing you to live will not spew you out. Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nation which I will drive out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. You are therefore to make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean, and between the unclean bird and the clean, and you shall not make yourselves detestable by animal or by bird or by anything that creeps on the ground, which I have separated for you as unclean. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. What we have here is basically a summary statement emphasizing why all of this is so important. God is kicking the current inhabitants out of the land because of their immorality. And if God's people are influenced by that immorality, he will remove them from the land as well. And so it is extremely important then that the people know the difference between the clean and the unclean and that they keep themselves separate from the world. 
Well, this brings us to the end, I think, of our fifth lesson from Leviticus. We have now studied the first 20 chapters, so we've been moving through this rather quickly, uh, covering now on average four chapters every week, which is outstanding. We are, we are booking it. Uh, next week, we hope to look at some rules, especially for the priest in chapter 21, and then I think we'll be able kind of to do an overview of the major feast days in chapters 22 and 23. And I think we'll kind of create a chart for the feast day, similar to what we had for the major sacrifices. So uh, look forward to that and uh, feel free to read ahead chapters 21 through 23. We'll cover those uh, in a couple weeks. Actually, next week, uh, I plan on being at uh, our Beaver Creek Bible Camp up near Eau Claire. So we'll probably have kind of a fill-in video. We will not be able to do that live. And so if you only get this live uh, through a notification through... Um, uh, one of our sources here through YouTube or something. Uh, we will not be doing that. I'll send out an email with a link to a video that you can watch at any time on your own. And then we'll come back in two weeks and pick up with uh, the rest of uh, Leviticus 21, 22, and 23. Uh, as always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. If there's something we need to be praying about, let us know if we can help or encourage you. Uh, send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can give me a call or send a text, 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father in heaven, you alone are holy in every way. Holy, holy, holy. And we come to you tonight as your people, wanting to be holy and separate from the world around us. Bless us with wisdom and courage and patience as we live as lights in a very dark place and help us to love others just as you love us. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We love you and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.